हेलो मधुसूदन रिगार्डिंग योर क्वेश्चन इन असाइनमेंट नंबर वन सो सो या आई एक्चुअली हैव टू लुक लुक इन टू इट सो आई हैवेंट लुक्ड एट इट येट सो सो आई लुक एट लुक एट द क्वेश्चन सो इफ यू आर एक्चुअली एबल टू शेयर योर स्क्रीन एंड शो मी वॉट एक्जैक्टली इज द इशू मे बी वी कैन डिस्कस on that can you do that sir good evening sir yeah. this is master dan sir yeah sir uh, in uh, this uh, for finding the deflection of this uh, cantilever beam yeah we are getting different answer sir that is uh, uh, 8a by uh, 824a by uh, wl cube sir okay okay but uh, no answer get, uh, no answer is available for that question sir okay okay actually i tried sir uh, three or four times even uh, sure. i talked with our senior also sir but sure. uh, given answer is related to simply supported beam sir actually okay okay please go through one sir uh, and uh, sure sure i yeah sure i will uh, actually go through uh, this and like i will revert back to you uh, on the discussion forum sir yeah sure. thank you sir thanks thank you sir yeah so maybe we can actually get started uh with the live session for this week so sir i want to know yeah. pattern of final exam pattern of the final exam uh yes so so it will be a written exam and in person that i think is there for sure but uh regarding the exact pattern like i am not Uh, really aware of that so because uh, i am actually uh, i have just joined the course recently uh, the course team so i think so can you post your question on the discussion forum so some of the other tas and the professor might be able to actually answer your query uh, in more detail but as of now i think uh, it will be like as per my understanding it will be uh, A written exam, which is subjective in nature, probably not multiple choice. Or if it is multiple choice, it will be like you know partially uh, multiple choice and partially subjective, uh, where you like to you know write your answers. So, so it will be a proctored uh, exam. So I I am that's all I can uh, like answer from my end. so i think you can actually post your question on the discussion forum that will be better does that help thank you sir yeah so i think yeah we can uh, get started with the live session so hopefully more people will join as we uh, progress so i'll just begin begin with a brief introduction about myself uh, so hi uh, all of you good evening uh, my name is parth joshi uh, i am a, a phd student of uh, the department of mechanical engineering at uh, iit bombay and uh, i am uh, a recipient of the prime minister's uh, research fellowship and as a part of that initiative so uh, i have got this opportunity so nptel has given me an opportunity to conduct uh live sessions for this course uh, so so the intention of these live sessions is to have more uh, live interaction so so that you can uh, ask your questions queries any doubts if you have uh, so so my plan is to also uh, so like basically address your queries any questions that you have and uh, also try to 
give you some flavor of uh, what kind of uh, problems that you can expect in the assignments uh, as we go through the, the as we progress through the course i will try to solve some uh, example problems for you hopefully that will be helpful uh, so in today's session i actually plan to uh, solve few problems uh, which are similar to some of the questions that you would find in the assignments and i also picked up some questions that came uh, which are related to vibration uh, like which are re basically related to the week 2 syllabus and uh, they they are they are the questions that appeared in uh, some of the recent gate examinations so i think many of you might be uh, looking forward to uh, you know appear for gate examinations and you might find that useful as well so i am like hopefully that will be also helpful uh, and and in today's uh, session i also want to introduce an activity for all of you so this is not part of the syllabus or anything like that just for your you know to generate more interest and uh, give you some like you know motivation for the course and its practical application in real life situations so i am actually planning to introduce an activity for you so so uh, like yeah so so i i hope uh, like so you uh, i would in, like encourage all of you to interact ask in as much question uh, as much questions as you can uh, whatever get your doubts clarified uh, i'll also try to answer as much as i can and uh, yeah hopefully uh, we will have a productive and uh, good interaction uh, session so yeah so so let's start so how many of you would like to learn uh, through experiments by uh, and through different activities so can you raise your hand so yeah shivam you raised your hand and <laughs> and have withdrawn it okay so okay fine sure thanks yeah so so yeah i think most of you would be uh, you know like to do some activity and learn concepts to that sure so yeah so in today's session i have planned to show you some activity where uh, you can actually do some experiments at your home uh, you know uh, like you know you can actually uh, explore the things around you so all of you might be using or most of you might be using you know smartphones nowadays they have become uh, quite affordable and uh, so so many of you might be like aware or some of you might be aware that the smartphones nowadays they have a lot of sensors installed in them and uh, so so in this activity you can actually make use of some of these sensors to do some uh, vibration measurements and uh, so you can do some simple experiments with you know things everyday things around you and uh, you can actually uh, you know learn to uh, make sense out of uh, data you can analyze the data record it first record the data of these sensors uh, and then learn some techniques to uh, process that data and make sense out of that so hopefully that will also be interesting and this is some new skill that you can actually pick up and apply later on in your future career so yeah so hopefully this activity will be uh, interesting for you yeah so shivam you have some question no sir uh, you had raised your hand uh, okay fine okay all right so uh, so many of you might be aware that you know smartphones have lot of sensors in them so it's listed over here in this slide uh, all of you can see the slide right uh, yes, all of you can see the slide yes sir yeah yeah okay sure thanks so uh, our smartphone has these different sensors so so can someone tell me how the phone knows like uh, 
so there is a feature of auto rotate in the screen so in uh, so while you know watching videos if you suddenly turn the phone or something like that or even if you are in your camera how does it know that your phone has rotated how does the auto rotate gravity sensor okay okay and what do you mean by gravity sensor yeah so they like basically it's because of the sensors that are uh, there in the present in the smartphone so there are accelerometers gyroscopes uh, so gyroscopes are basically the sensors that can sense the change in the orientation of the smartphone so here on the right side you can see a figure of the smartphone its x y z axis are shown so it has an uh, so its axis are usually like that so so the z axis is perpendicular to the plane of the smartphone and uh, the x axis is along the uh, x and y axis are along the uh, plane of the smartphone so uh, so basically the uh, there are some apps which you can actually install and use these apps to record the data from these uh, sensors so um, so we were talking about the auto rotate thing so the gyroscope is one of the sensors that can actually sense the change in the orientation of the phone so it knows that your phone has rotated um, by 90 degrees now so now it actually then rotates the screen as well along with that so so this is how it uh, uses these different sensors then there are uh, other sensors like humidity uh, proximity touch sensors temperature sensors uh, which uh, are used like either for some safety purpose or some uh, like you know the, the phone should not overheat um, so if it is overheated it may actually switch off uh, cut off its supply and all that so uh, so in this activity we can actually use uh, uh, then some of the sensors uh, for you know to rec uh, so you have to basically uh, first learn how to record uh, the data from these sensors so the activity which i am proposing is like this is one simple activity that you know i am suggesting you can actually extend this activity to any uh, practical scenario any system that you think is of interest to you so you can perform this simple experiment like uh, you know you can just take a one foot uh, ruler like metallic or plastic or anything 30 centimeter scale and then attach your smartphone to that and uh, now your scale as well as along with the smartphone it has become a pendulum right so you can you know some of these metallic rulers they have a hole at the one of the end so there you can actually use that hole to hang it somewhere on the wall on a nail or something and then you can just give it some initial angle and just leave it and leave it to oscillate so it will oscillate like a pendulum right so now uh, so your scale plus smartphone together it works like a simple pendulum right so now uh, so now you can use your smartphone as a pendulum as well as the uh, data recording device so now here i have mounted uh, the smartphone like in a in a way such that its xy plane is aligned with the you know the plane of the uh, the wall or whatever like whatever uh, you are hanging it and the z axis is perpendicular to the plane of the smartphone right so now uh, you can record the sensor data using some of the apps that are available so for android users i'm aware of some of these apps like firefox or physics toolbox uh, so there are many uh, data logging sensor data logging apps that you will find on the relevant app stores like for play store for android users and maybe app store for uh, apple users so uh, so you can install some of these sensor data logging apps and then so start recording the data so so before you give the initial displacement to the pendulum you start recording the data and leave the 
you know smartphone to oscillate and uh, then uh, let it oscillate and uh, wait till all the vibrations of the pendulum die out and then after it has uh, you know become stationary so you can stop the data recording and save it so so this is one part of the experiment so for now you can just you know keep it uh, save it and then in the meanwhile while the pendulum is oscillating you can actually estimate the time period using stopwatch uh, so basically you can measure uh, how much time it has uh, you know spent between one cycle so so you know you can just keep an eye on the extreme position of the pendulum and uh, measure like you know the time it takes for let us say 10 cycles so you start recording and record let us say 10 cycles and uh, measure the time required to complete 10 cycles and find the average time for 10 cycles and let us say that is the time period and from that you can estimate the natural frequency and also estimate the natural frequency from hand calculation so you may know, you might be knowing like you know the natural frequency uh, equation for the simple pendulum and uh, so here it will not be exactly like a simple pendulum because uh, like a simple pendulum it is assuming a point mass but here it's like a distributed mass so it will have the phone will have some you know finite moment of inertia uh, the scale will also have a finite moment of inertia you can basically do some hand calculations and estimate uh, the natural frequency from that so you can do some hand calculations now uh, so so you basically have already have let us say an estimate of natural frequency from two methods now the third method is the method is basically to so you have to analyze the data from the which is recorded by the smartphone so so here i have shown some raw data so you will you know the sensor will record some data like from the accelerometer or uh, from the uh, you know the gyroscope so it will look something like that and then we have to process this data and generate a plot which is shown on the right hand side corner which is uh, here which is shows a peak of some kind so that is called a fft uh, basically a frequency distribution uh, plot so a fast fourier so if you perform a fast fourier transform operation so basically you transfer like transform this data from time domain to frequency domain uh, and generate this FFT plot, which uh, shows like the left hand side of like the x, x axis is frequency and y axis of that plot is uh, amplitude. So, so I am talking about the right hand side plot. So from that actually, so, so wherever the location of the peak is, that is basically the peak corresponding to the natural frequency of the system. So there is a process to go from this raw data to generate this FFT plot. So I will not cover that in today's session. So this was just a you know brief you know kind of a trailer to give you some idea of you know how you can use your smartphone to do some experiments. So we'll actually talk about that process in a later session as as and when we get time. So so does this seem interesting? So can I get some feedback from you? What about how? What do you think? This is, is this interesting? Okay. So yeah, you can actually explore this. So you can actually record data for any system that is not necessarily this pendulum or anything. You can actually think of anything that is you know vibrating that is doing some motion and record data. You can process it later on. Uh, so we'll go through that process how to process that data later on but you can basically use this approach to do some experiments and make sense out of that data so yeah so then so any questions any comments
okay so then i i guess uh, so we can actually start off with our uh, problem solving part so yeah so now we'll go through some sample problems uh, so anyone has any questions or any que uh, queries before that okay sure uh, thanks so we'll get started now so here in this figure we have a system uh, which is which shows a mass that is suspended from the uh, roof through a spring and there is another ma mass attached using a rod of length l uh, to the mass that is suspended from the spring so now there was actually a question from one of the uh, participants in the course so on the discussion forum uh, he wanted to know um, about uh, degrees of freedom and uh, so so now i'll basically so so based on that i have selected this example to explain more about degrees of freedom so yeah so before before going into the details so can any guesses any answers on uh, how many degrees does, of freedom does this system have can you answer that two okay okay one so yeah so all like rupak and madhusudan can you explain like individually uh, why why do you think uh, it is two or one or whatever so you can unmute yourself and speak x and theta are two unknowns okay fine so to describe this system yeah. we required only one uh, uh, an independent variable like theta sir so that's why i said one sir okay so how is it just one uh, variable that is uh, for evaluating the system we required only angle theta that is enough to describe the system okay uh okay fine uh, yeah hold on so we'll see uh, um, your uh, we'll discuss more on your answer so basically yeah so the meaning of degrees of, degrees of freedom is that you have to find out what are the number of independent variables as you said to describe the behavior of the system so here there are two masses so so now before like you know even evaluating whether it is two or one or whatever so so how many types of motions that each of these masses can perform so let us say if this mass which is suspended from the spring so if there is uh, no uh, nothing to actually uh, restrict its motion anywhere so then it it can actually do you know three translation along three axis and rotation along any of the three axis right so it would have six degrees of freedom if it was just you know floating in space uh, but now there is a spring attached so it will cause some you know it will to some extent it will uh, cause some uh, you know restriction on the degrees of freedom then so if here if we actually attach some you know some kind of rollers over here which will allow uh, the motion of this mass so let us say i i will not spoil this figure i'll just make another figure uh, here so so let us say this is this is this so if we actually have some rollers which will restrict this mass and allow its motion only uh, like this so then this mass can move only up and down it cannot rotate about any axis or anything so it's like 
you know uh, moving through a some kind of a tube or something like that so then it has one degree of freedom yeah sorry so there was a problem with my screen sharing i will just get it back Yeah, sorry for the interruption. So, so here now, so now the first mass has one degree of freedom. So, so it needs just one variable x to describe its position. Now, what about the second mass? So, let us say if we attach a coordinate system over here. Now, x is let us say there is some we call this as x one and. Uh, let us say this is as, as x2 or let us say you know we call this as you know, y1 and uh, let us say this the second one as y2 and uh, let us say this is x2 so so now we have three variables here right so out of these three how many are actually independent so now to find out that so we basically so we also have a theta over here right so there are like y1 then so now like we have already established that this uh, mass will always keep moving along the this axis so then it's only y1 that is used for describing its position then we have x2 y2 and also theta so but x2 y2 and theta are actually not three independent things so they are actually related to each other by some trigonometric relation so basically so we can say tan theta is equal to x2 upon y2 minus y1 so therefore so only one out of these three is actually independent the other two actually are dependent through this relation so we have this plus this So, so we have uh, this. So we know the length of this pendulum. We we know theta. So and we know if we know y one. So so if we know y one l and theta, then we actually know the entire position of the both the masses, right? So then so you have one plus one equal to total two variables that are. You know, so it can be it can be either x and theta, or it can be you know uh, y one and y two, or anything like that. But it will be basically two only two things that are uh, two independent variables that are required. Does that make sense? Any doubts? Sure, thanks. So we'll move on to the next problem. So here we have a equation of motion for a damped uh, viscous vibration. Nine x double dot plus six x dot plus twenty five x is equal to zero. So we for a uh, any damped viscous uh, system vibration. So for that we have uh, you know the equation differential equation is of this form, right? m x double dot plus c x dot plus k x. So here m is basically the let us say the mass. C is the 
damping and uh, k is basically the stiffness yeah someone actually posted the answer uh, point 0.2 okay yeah sure yeah i think you are uh, you are right so yeah we'll just uh, check that so now how do we find the damping ratio so we know basically m is equal to 9 so if we compare these equations so c is c is equal to 6 and k is equal to 25 so using this so the damping ratio is basically c divided by the critical damping so that is basically the damping ratio zeta and critical damping is defined as 2 into square root of k into m right so that is 2 into square root of 25 into 9 which is 2 into 5 into 3 which is 30 so now we have c is 6 so zeta is 6 by 30 which is which is 1 by 5 which is 0.2 so you are right uh, Rupak right so so point 2 is indeed the correct answer make sense so I think we can proceed with the next problem yeah sure then uh, a mask of 5 kg is attached to the end of a spring uh, so basically mass m is let us say 5 then we have stiffness k is 0.5 newton per mm and we have been given that damping is only 30 percent of the critical value so we know basically c by cc critical damping is zeta which is 30 percent or 0.3 so the frequency of damped vibration is omega d let us say we call it as omega d is omega n into square root of 1 minus zeta square so assuming that it's a so it's because zeta is 0.3 it is zeta is less than 1 so it is under damped so then we can use this relation to find out the damped natural frequency so which is basically so omega n is root a by m into root of 1 minus zeta square so which is basically so 0 0.5 newton per mm so 0 0.5 by 0.5 by 5 into square root of 1 minus 0.3 square so so it's basically square root of 100 into point nine one. 
so it is 10 into square root of 0.91 which So it will be something like about 9.54, right? Radian per second. Is that correct? So you got 95.39, okay. So but I think you can, you, I think there is some yeah, it's actually 9.54, right? Because it's square root of 100. It's not 100 into point root of 0.9, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so that was a, I think, a straightforward problem. So, these are the kind of questions that you would probably encounter in the assignments. So, now we actually move on to a question that actually appeared in the gate exam in the year 2021 so here so don't get afraid because like you know directly uh, i'm moving on to a gate level question or anything like that so there is nothing uh, so you know tough or anything like that so you just have to understand the problem very carefully uh, and uh, just apply your basic concepts and uh, try to solve that so uh, here we have a single degree of freedom system which is a mass spring and damper so this dashpot is basically a damper and uh, here we have a spring over here so the uh, it asked that if the amplitude of free vibration it responds it reduces from 8 mm to 1.5 mm in three cycles then we have to calculate the damping ratio of the system or zeta basically so now how do we solve this problem so now in the question it is not explicitly given whether the system is uh, you know over damped or under damped or critically damped but it says that you know the word cycles is used so yeah logarithmic decrement is the thing that you need to apply here so it says cycles so then that from that you can actually you know get a clue that it is under damped or zeta should be less than one so uh, so for an under damped system uh, how does the amplitude uh, vary? So it varies something like that. So, so the amplitude actually goes, it oscillates and at the same time there is an exponential decrease in the uh, amplitude, the maximum amplitude. So, so the, it is an expression of the form of So this will be the kind of uh, the nature of uh, the oscillations. So let us say x versus time. So it is an expression of the form x is a e raised to power minus zeta omega nt uh, into cos omega dp plus y. So let us say if we look at the point over here and let us say we call it as x1. 
so after one cycle the system reaches over here so that is like one time period t so this is one cycle after another cycle it reaches this point x3 so again this is one time period and finally it after three cycles so or basically three time periods it reaches this point x4 so we have been given that x1 is 8 mm or whatever units and x4 is 1.5 so we now apply this thing uh, so basically let us say this is some time t1 at which we measure x1 so we can write x1 is some a t to the power minus zeta omega n t1 cos omega d so omega t d is basically the uh, damped natural frequency phi is the phase difference and x4 so this is at time so let us say t4 is equal to t1 plus three times three time periods right so x4 is a e raised to minus zeta omega n into t1 plus 3t into cos omega d into t1 plus 3t plus pi so so the time period and the damped natural frequency are related by this relation so 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 basically the value of this expression and this expression basically they are uh, corresponding to the same uh, point on the so it's corresponding let us say to the crest or trough or whatever any point so they are they are actually after three different cycles so this after three time periods this will actually reach the same value right so then so we can actually verify from this so 3t into omega d will be 6 pi so cos of 6 pi plus omega d into t1 so, so this value and this value they will be just it will be shifted by three time periods forward so so then that will not affect the value of the cos uh, cos theta whatever value so then it will be identical so they are equal so if we have to write x4 by x1 which is 1.5 by 8 it is a e raised to minus theta omega n t1 plus 3t cos omega d t t1 plus phi divided by a e raised to minus zeta omega n t1 into cos omega d t1 now here t1 plus 3 t plus phi so because these two expressions are equal they will get cancelled and we just and since a is also here so a, a also gets cancelled and uh, yeah so we have e raised to minus zeta omega n t1 term also in both numerator as well as denominator so we have basically 1.5 by 8 is equal to e raised to minus zeta omega n t1 into e raised to minus zeta omega n 3t divided by e raised to minus zeta omega n t1 so then this will also get cancelled and we have e raised to minus 3 zeta omega n into t So, so if we 
now take the natural log of both sides so ln so it will be minus 3 zeta omega n t to ln of e so ln of e will be 1 so it is minus 3 zeta omega n into t so so we can also write so just to adjust for this minus sign so we can just write it as ln of 8 by 1.5 is equal to 3 zeta omega n into t so t will be 2 pi upon omega d which is 3 zeta into 2 pi on omega n upon so omega n into root of 1 minus theta square so, so omega n will be cancelled and we have 6 pi zeta upon root of 1 minus zeta square which is equal to ln of 8 by 1.5 so this is like a quadratic equation and uh, so you can uh, just uh, you know solve this quadratic equation so So let us say like 6 pi zeta upon root of 1 minus zeta square is equal to ln of 8 by 1.5. Now if we square both sides, so then we have 36 pi square zeta square upon 1 minus zeta square is equal to ln of 8 by 1.5. Whole square so we have basically 36 pi square upon ln of 8 by 1.5 whole square into zeta square is equal to 1 minus zeta square so we can just simply solve for zeta square over here so, so what will be the value of zeta square so it will be 1 upon 1 plus 36 pi square upon ln of 8 by 1.5 whole square. Is that okay? So from this we can calculate the value of zeta. So can uh, someone Calculate the value of zeta and tell me. So any any doubts? So I got the value of something about 0 0.09.
so i am also solving live along with you so so please correct me if there is any if i have made any mistake in any step but i got something around 0.088 or something like that yeah i also got 0.088 or something or approximately 0.09 So, fine, I think so then we move on to the next question. So this again is a question which appeared in the uh, gate 2022 this year itself. So here, so don't again uh, you know get afraid of the you know there is a huge description and all that so it's a you just have to read through carefully all the entire question so a rigid uniform annular disc so is pivoted on a knife edge so so the knife edge is a in a uniform gravitational field such that it can execute small simple harmonic motion so the, the there is a relation between the inner radius and the outer radius uh, so if we basically uh, displace this system by some small angle and then leave it to oscillate it will be like a an oscillations of a simple pendulum so so the distance between this AG, basically the rate is the same as the radius R. So, so if we, you know, consider like A as a pivot, so, and we, if we consider a, you know, simple pendulum, that is, which has the same mass as this disc and which is concentrated at the center of mass g then it's essentially same as that system or similar to that so so what we have to do is we have to find out the natural frequency of small oscillations of this system so so what are the forces that will be in acting on this system so let us draw a uh, Three body diagrams. So let's say if we, you know, displace this mass. I'm sorry about the bad drawing but hopefully we are able to understand whatever I am drawing. So let us say if we displace this disk by theta then at the knife edge this is, let us say this is edge A, A and here this is the center of gravity G. So here the weight will be the force acting over here let us say we call the weight as w and uh, this is the radius r small r and this is the outer radius capital r so now how do we basically find out the natural frequency so for that we have to first find out the uh, equation of motion so now how do we find out uh, the equation of motion here any any uh, if you can contribute
how do we derive the equation of motion for this? Any any answers? No idea. Okay, fine. So, have you learned uh, about the simple pendulum thing uh, earlier? Like, so let us say if we have a simple pendulum like this, it is suspended. How do we derive its equation of motion? So, there are various methods to derive its equation of motion. So, you can actually apply either Newton's uh, second law or you can use an energy method by which like you calculate the kinetic energy and potential energy expressions and then differentiate it with respect to time um, and then try to calculate basically the uh, equation of motion so similarly uh, here what we will do is we can actually apply uh, we, we can instead of calculating uh, forces we will take the moment about the knife edge a to derive the equation of motion so we will take moment about the point a so so if we calculate uh, the moment about a the uh, forces fx and fy will not contribute so the, those are the forces exerted at the knife edge let us say and apart from that there is only the weight that is contributing to the moment so what will be the moment of uh, moment of uh, uh, the because of the force w Yeah, so it will be W into R into sine theta, right? Right. And and we know uh, like from Newton's second law so that is so this is w r sin theta in so which is pointing into the plane of the paper so let us say it is uh, so let us say this is x axis y axis and the z axis is going in inside into the plane of paper so this is b k cap in minus g direction so now here theta is like this so it is in clockwise direction so which will be negative so, so we assume theta like this the angular velocity theta double dot theta dot and theta double dot basically the angular velocity and the angular acceleration are also in this anti-clockwise direction so with respect to this coordinate system will be negative right because uh, so basically if we uh, rotate from x to y it will be go into the plane of the paper so which will be clockwise so clockwise is positive in this coordinate system uh, with respect to our if we view from the top uh, and so here let us say if theta W is not passing through point A directly. It has, it is making, it is always vertically downwards. So it is displaced by some angle theta. Uh, so 
it will have some non zero contribution of the moment if it is displaced so if it was like vertically directly downward then it will be no moment because of that right yeah so so here it so the moment can also be written as minus j theta double dot where j is basically the moment of inertia of the or mass moment of inertia j so this is basically the uh, so we have the moment uh, given by this uh, because of the weight and we also know the uh, it's in terms of the angular acceleration so we have now the equation of motion that is w r sin theta is minus j theta double dot so now if the angle is small so then theta is nearly equal to sin theta is nearly equal to tan theta so we take this small angle approximation and then we uh, basically get that w into r into theta is minus j theta double dot so this is now in that similar form of like the single uh, simple pendulum so we have theta double dot j theta double dot plus w into r into theta is zero so this is the equation of the equation of motion so then what is the natural frequency so you, so for a simple harmonic motion what is the usual form theta double dot is plus omega n square theta is equal to 0 so it is the normal form for any simple harmonic motion for the differential equation we have our differential equation in the similar form so if we now if we compare these two equations we will get that omega n square is w r upon j right so it will be w r upon j right so that is our natural frequency So till this point, are there any questions? Any step that is not understood? Yeah, so you can actually reach to this point using other methods as well. So you can actually uh, write, you, you know, you, uh, write expressions for the kinetic energy and potential energy of this and, uh, you know, differentiate the kinetic energy and potential energy with respect to time and then uh, you will reach the same uh, equation of motion and uh, so you can also try out that approach on your own so now what remains here is to basically simplify this expression of omega n square is w r upon j so w r is basically m into g into r upon j so now how do we find out the mass m so what we know is that this has inner radius small r and outer radius capital r and it is uniform So let us say it has a density is equal to rho. So then we find out the mass in terms of 
volume into density so what is the volume so because it is a disk let us say it have it has a thickness there are some problem so yeah just a moment So uh, we we were we had reached to this point. So we were calculating the mass in mass is equal to in terms of volume and density. So let us say we have a thickness of this disk as let us say T. So so what will be the volume of this disk? It will be rho into uh basically the mass will be rho into the volume so it will be pi into capital r square minus small r square into t so this will be our one equation and other equation will be basically for j how do we calculate j now so that is basically the polar mass moment of inertia so let us say if this is a if there is a solid disk of some radius r and it has some mass m so its moment of inertia about <coughs> so let us say z axis is pointing out of the uh, plane so it will be m r square by 2 for a solid disk so here we have a annular disk so so what do we do so we let us say calculate the moment of inertia of a disk with the outer radius r and you also separately calculate the moment of inertia of the let us say there was another disk with the which has the same radius as the inner radius r so we calculate so let us say we call this as j1 for capital r minus the moment of inertia for So we basically uh, try to calculate the moment of inertia J1 and J2. So what will be J1? So let us say this has a mass m1 and this has a mass m2. So what will be m1? So m1 will be rho pi r square into t. So thickness will be same for both the disks. And m2. will be rho into pi into small r square into thickness and we uh, so we have j1 will be m1 r square by 2 and j2 is m2 to small r square by is it is it okay till this step any doubts till this step
okay yeah so now we will further simplify j so it will be m1 r square by 2 minus m2 small r square by 2 which will be so rho pi r square t into r square by 2 minus rho pi r square into thickness in into small r square by 2 so basic basically it is rho pi by 2 into t into capital r raised to 4 minus small r raised to 4 so what was our expression for natural frequency it was omega n is square is m g r upon j which is so the expression what was the expression for the mass so it was rho pi r square minus small r square into t into smaller and we have rho pi into t into capital R is to 4 minus small r r is to 4 into divided by 2. So we have some things uh, common in the numerator and denominator so all these things will get cancelled. So we have 2r into capital R square minus small r square divided by r to the power 4 minus small r to the power 4. So we can use like the identity for a square minus b square. So it will be same as capital R square plus small r square divided by capital R square minus small r square. So we can write this like this and so this will get again cancelled. So it will be 2r upon small r square plus capital R square. So we have been given that r square is capital R square by 2. So, so then small r will be r by root 2. So it will be basically 2r by root 2 upon r square plus r square by 2. So it will be root 2 r divided by 3 by 2 r square or 2 root 2 by 3 r yeah so i forgot to write g over here so yeah So, till this step it is, is it okay? So, this is basically uh, how we derive the natural frequency. So, now we have been asked in the question. What is the, so time period for that we have this expression T is equal to so basically time period is 2 pi upon omega n and uh, we have the expression for omega n so it is 2 pi divided by two root 2 g by 3 r so
so it will be root r by g into root of 3 upon 2 root 2 into 2 so So this will be 2 and this will again be root 2. So it will be square root of so root of 3 root 2 into pi into root of r by g. So so this is the factor beta that is asked in the question. So, so that that's all that I had for today's session from my end. So there 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 are some more uh, problems which I have. So so which you can actually try on your own. So there there, there are some more check uh, questions over here. Uh, yeah. So there is one question. Yeah. Okay. You go ahead. You can ask. So, can you unmute yourself and speak? Uh, what is the question that you have? So do you have a question in the IMG form? Uh, what 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 do you mean by IMG form? image of the question yeah this question uh, the current one so can you Rupa, can you uh, you want to share something uh, yeah so you can uh, can you share your screen So I can actually stop sharing my screen if you want. Do you want to share your screen? Yeah, sure. I'll just stop sharing my screen and uh, then you can share your screen. I am not able to share the screen. You are not able to share the screen. Okay. Uh, okay. Just a moment. Yeah. Now try. Can you try now? Yeah. I can see your screen. Go ahead. All the spherical ball. Okay. So yeah, what what is the question? Natural frequency natural frequency of small oscillations of this ball so you, you want to find out uh, okay fine okay yeah so yeah so half of its volume is submerged so you you have been given that so how yes, do you so you what is the question that you had so i understood your question so fine uh, what is the doubt that you have you want to know how to solve this Yes. Huh? Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, so, can you, you know, uh, share a screenshot of this and post to the chat? This image? Yes, sir. Yeah, so, yeah, and you can then stop sharing your screen. 
so that we'll have this question uh, in the background yeah so we can discuss this question there is no option to send images in chat acha okay fine so can you just paste uh, the screenshot over there like if you, like does it get sent that way i'm not sure like whether it get sent that way yeah anyway but like i got your basic question so let's like you know you can actually do the calculations on your own we'll just just discuss the uh, overall approach that you know you can take yes sure so yeah so let me share my screen now yeah so in your question you have some you know ball that is in water so half of it is submerged right and you some like just poke it uh, like you know make it go slightly inside and uh, then release it and then it will move up and down that's the question right yes so how do you think you can solve this what is your approach buoyancy force yeah buoyancy force will act on it so so if you so in this position when it is half submerged and let us say it is in equilibrium so then so then there is it has its weight and there is a buoyancy force so these are the only two forces acting on it yes so then when it is stationary in water that it will be in equilibrium right so buoyant force will be same as mg weight now what happens like if you displace this into uh, you know push it down let us say it looks something like this so then this much volume is inside so let us say v1 and the one on top is v2 so v1 is greater than v2 so so uh, here when it is in equilibrium let us say this is the half volume so half volume of the ball so half of volume of the ball so what so what does the uh principle like buoyancy principle say like here what will be the uh weight of displaced water weight of displaced water right so how much of water is being displaced so that is how much of uh, water has been displaced because volume of submerged ball into density of water correct so it will be rho water into 2/2 yeah so it will be basically half of volume of the ball into uh, into basically that so what is half of the so it will be let us say this volume it's it's let us say some sphere so it will be 4/3 pi r cube so into half so that is basically the mass of the uh, water displaced into g so that will be the weight, weight of water displaced so that is basically equal to the buoyant force right yes sir yeah so sorry 
green one pa. Yun. So now here Yeah, are you able to see the screen now? Yes. Oh, again, oh, sorry. Actually, there is some problem with my screen sharing. So, just hold on. So, what I was saying is that, uh, so if you displace this ball down, then the volume of water displaced will change, weight of or basically weight of water that will be displaced that will change. So, let us say if you, you know, submerge it further by some amount dx, uh, so then So let, 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 let us say this was half of the, so this is the hemisphere uh, and this is let us say dx. So you need to find out this volume dv which is the additional volume. So let us say this is v. So, so rho into rho of like basically the density of water. into V plus dV into G so that will be the new buoyant force right yes so uh, and uh, so basically the buoyant force Fb minus its weight mg are the uh, basically the two uh, acceleration so so let's call it just x small x not let us say don't get in will not get into like, uh, v, d, v or whatever so let's just call it as small x and let us say it's very small and uh, yeah so so this is let us say we call it as v1 plus this vx so our job is now to find vx so we know v1 already so vx is basically this disk right and it has a thickness x and so what will be its 
volume so let us say x is very small so that it it's more or less like a neglect sure. that the fact that it is a sphere or anything like that it's like more or less similar to a disk you can approximately write its volume as pi r square into yes. x right yes sir right so rho of water into vx plus v1 into g minus mg is equal to Uh, minus m x double dot. Yes. So this is a, 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 let us say this is the up, uh, equation of motion. Right? You agree? Yes. Sir. So now you know v x is pi r square x. You know what is v one and uh, you know what is m g m and m x double dot. So so you can and you know what is m right so m is rho into 4 by 3 pi r cube into g so then you can actually substitute the value of vx and then simplify this expression and you will get the uh, equation of motion so so rho w into v1 into g is same as mg right yes sir so then this will actually get cancelled so then you will be just left with rho w into vx into g is plus mx double dot is equal to zero okay again my screen share has gone but yeah i think but, but basically i guess you got the point yes sir now i can proceed it yeah so, so you can actually solve further and get the actual value of natural frequency and uh, simplify further. Yes, sir. So, yeah, so that's it for today's session. So, I hope the live session was useful. Thank you, sir. So, thank you for joining and uh, listening patiently. So, I hope uh, more of your friends join uh, the next live session in the next week. So that's all from my end. Any any uh, further questions, comments? Okay, fine. So then we can end this session over here. So thank you for joining. All the best.